morning and welcome to our morning worship today. Um, let's begin by, as we normally do, thinking about God our Father is with us by his Spirit, both within us and around us. So grace, mercy and peace. From God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all and also with you. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. We've come together in the name of Christ to offer our praise and thanksgiving to hear and receive God's holy word to pray for the needs of the world and to seek the forgiveness of our sins, that by the power of the Holy Spirit, we may give ourselves to the service of God. Jesus says, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is close at hand. So let us turn away from our sin and turn to Christ, confessing our sins in penitence and faith. Lord God, we have sinned against you. We have done evil in your sight. We are sorry and repent. Have mercy on us according to your love. Wash away our wrongdoing and cleanse us from our sin. Renew a right spirit within us and restore us to the joy of your salvation, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And may the Father of all mercies cleanse you from your sins and restore you in his image to the praise and glory of his name, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Blessed is the Lord for he has heard the voice of our prayer. Therefore shall our hearts dance for joy, and in our song will be pray, we, will, we praise our God. Blessed are you, Lord our God, creator and redeemer of all. To you be glory and praise forever. From the waters of chaos you drew forth the world and in your great love fashioned us in your image. Now, through the deep waters of death, you have brought your people to new birth by raising your son to life in triumph. May Christ your light ever dawn in our hearts as we offer you our sacrifice of thanks and praise. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Blessed be God forever. We're now going to listen and at home we can all join in and sing of course with And Can It Be, that wonderful hymn. And it will be followed by our first reading which is going to be read by Steve.
This morning's first reading is taken from the book of 2 Samuel, chapter 6, verses 1 to 5 and 12b to 19. David again gathered all the chosen men of Israel, 30,000. David and all the people with him set out and went from Baal Judah to bring up from there the Ark of God which is called by the name of the Lord of hosts, who is enthroned on the cherubim. They carried the ark of God on a new cart and brought it out of the house of Abinadab, which was on the hill. Uzzah and Ahio, the sons of Abinadab, were driving the new cart with the ark of God, and Ahio went in front of the ark. David and all the house of Israel were dancing before the Lord with all their might, with songs and lyres and harps and tambourines and castanets and cymbals. So David went and brought up the ark from the house of Obed-Eam to the city of David with rejoicing. And when those who bore the ark of the Lord had gone six paces, He sacrificed an ox and a fatling. David danced before the Lord with all his might. David was girdled with a linen ephod. So David and all the house of Israel brought up the ark of the Lord with shouting and with the sound of the trumpet. Here ends the first reading. We now come to our canticle, a song of David. Blessed are you, God of Israel, forever and ever. For yours is the greatness, the power, the glory, the splendor and the majesty. Everything in heaven and on earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord, and you are exalted as head over all. Riches and honour come from you, and you rule over all. In your hand are power and might. Yours it is to give power and strength to all. And now we give you thanks, our God, and praise your glorious name. For all things come from you, and of your own have we given you. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and shall be forever. Amen. We now come to our Gospel reading, which is being led this morning, read this morning by Ryan. This reading is taken from Mark chapter 6, verses 14 to 29. King Herod heard of it, for Jesus' name had become known. Some were saying, John the baptizer has been raised from the dead, and for this reason these powers are at work in him. But others said it is Elijah, and others said it is a prophet, like one of the prophets of old. But when Herod heard of it, he said, John, whom I beheaded, has been raised. For Herod himself had sent men who arrested John, bound him, and put him in prison on account of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, because Herod had married her. For John had been telling Herod, It is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. And Herodias has a grudge against him, and wanted to kill him. But she could not, for Herod feared John, knowing that he was a righteous and holy man, and he protected him. When he heard him, he was greatly perplexed, And yet, he liked to listen to him. But an opportunity came when Herod, on his birthday, gave a banquet for his courtiers and officers and for the leaders of Galilee. When his daughter Herodias came in and danced, she pleased Herod and his guests. And the king said to the girl, Ask me for whatever you wish, and I will give it. And he solemnly swore to her, Whatever you ask me, I will give you, even half of my kingdom. She went out and said to her mother, What should I ask for? She replied, the head of John the baptizer. Immediately, 
she rushed back to the king and requested, I want you to give me at once the head of John the Baptizer on a platter. The king was deeply grieved, yet, out of regard for his oaths and for the guests, he did not want to refuse her. Immediately, the king sent a soldier of the guard with orders to bring John's head. He went and beheaded him in the prison, brought his head on a platter and gave it to the girl. Then the girl gave it to her mother. When his disciples heard about it, they came and took his body and laid it in a tomb. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And now we come to our sermon this morning. Let's first pray. Holy God, we pray that you would open our hearts and minds to understand our reading and that we would learn and inwardly digest from its meaning and warnings. Amen. Have you noticed how in many programmes on the television now, they use flashbacks? Recently, I watched a programme called Innocent. You may have seen it yourselves. It was a story about a wrongly imprisoned woman accused of murdering a young pupil of hers. And it wasn't until the very last episode that through a flashback, you found out what had really happened and who the real murderer was. How is that rele relevant, you might be wondering? Well, I remember when I was first a Christian, um, the first book that I read in the Bible was actually the Gospel of Mark. It was so fast paced, I couldn't believe it. And by the end of chapter five, I'd become spellbound by the stories of Jesus, his baptism, his calling and sending out of his disciples, of various healings, and then seemingly out of nowhere, this account of the beheading of John the Baptist, which at that time seemed a bit bizarre to me. But of course, now I realize that Mark is making use of a flashback and he does it in a very deliberate way. It is actually the only story in the gospel of any length that's not about Jesus. And it's no accident that Mark places it here where he does. Jesus, if you remember from last week, had just finished giving instructions to his disciples about how they were to embody, um, give expression to God's love in the world. And he doesn't just tell them, but he warns them that they should expect opposition, opposition and trouble. But nevertheless, he tells them that they need to go out and all they need to take with them was the gospel and a confident faith. And it's here, as if to slam home to us, to make his point here, that Mark reminds us of the story of John the Baptist. I want to give you a little bit of background because I used to get the Herods confused. So Herod the Great was the one who had all the babies in Bethlehem killed when Jesus was born. In this story, we're talking about Herod Antipas, or Antipater to give him his full title. And he was actually one of the sons of Herod the Great. And he became ruler of the Galilee, where Jesus mainly ministered. He did actually have another area as well called Perea, on the southeastern side of the Dead Sea, bordering with the Nabataean kingdom, which we probably know because of the once ancient capital Petra. Now, Herod Antipas became besotted with his brother's wife, Herodias. He divorced his first wife. She was the daughter of the king of this neighboring Nabataean territory. And the wife had to flee back to her father in fear of her life. Now, when Antipas married Herodias, he violated 
Jewish laws. Not just on one, but on two counts. The first one was adultery, and the second was being married to his brother's wife whilst he was still alive. And all of the gospel, well, the synoptic gospels, tell us that it was this marriage which John the Baptist publicly criticised by telling him how wrong it was. And in fact, here in Mark, in verse 18, it said, it's not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. Taking in a little bit of geography too, Herod's palaces included one at Tiberias on the Sea of Galilee, one at Sepphoris, which was just a few miles from Nazareth, and a fortress palace called Macarius near the border with the Nabataean kingdom, which is where it's believed this incident took place. But as two of his palaces were in Galilee, it's hardly surprising that Herod came to hear about the healings that were being reported about Jesus. We're told in verse 14 and 15 that people were asking, who is this man? And that some were saying, John the Baptist has been raised from the dead. And for this reason, there are powers that work in him. Other people were saying, it's Elijah. And yet others said, it's a prophet, like one of the prophets of old. Now, it seems that Herod was also having flashbacks. His conscience was troubling him because of the terrible wrong he'd done. And the suspicious Herod thought Jesus was John the Baptist raised from the dead. You see, the staggering fact is that we learn from verse 20 that Herod actually feared John. He knew that he was a righteous and holy man. And in fact, he tried to protect, Herod, protect John from Herodias by actually imprisoning him. Because when he went to listen to him, he was greatly perplexed and he liked to listen to John. So Mark tells us here how it had all happened at a banquet that Herod had given for prominent leaders, VIPs from both the Jews and the Romans. And this was where Herodias' daughter had danced seductively. We can only imagine the sleazy scene that unfolded in the midst of the drunken crowd. It certainly aroused and pleased Herod so very much that he foolishly offered her anything she so desired. And this was the opportunity her mother Herodias had been waiting for. And she demanded that her daughter ask for John's head on a platter. Presumably to save face in front of his watching guests, Antipas felt he had no option but to agree. What a gruesome story of evil, treachery and murder. And it's actually hard to decide who was the worst. Was it Herod or the two evil women, Herodias and her daughter? or even the high-ranking officials and leaders of Galilee who went along with what led to John the Baptist's death. It would have been scandalous. And we know from Luke chapter 8, verses 2 and 3, that Joanna was the wife of Chusa, who was the head of the household of Antipas. And Joanna was listed as one of the followers and providers for Jesus. Was this how the details came to be known, both to Peter and then related on to Mark? At the end of the story, we hear how John's young cousin, who's only six months older than Jesus, was quietly taken away by his disciples and buried with the dignity he deserved. This isn't just a story to remind us of the dangers of preaching the truth, although that's certainly true. 
It's a story to remind us of the delusions of the powerful. Herod's own actions triggered him to have deep-seated fear about the results of his deeds. He interprets what he hears about Jesus by imagining John having come back to get him. Nor is it a story to tip us off about what's to befall Jesus in the end too. Of course, a similar fate is to befall him, as it often befalls anyone with the courage to speak truth to the powerful. Mark points out that even defenceless, unarmed, decapitated dead men like John the Baptist come back to haunt the powerful of this world. Herod Antipas was eventually to meet Jesus. He'd wanted to see him for a long time, hoping to see one of his miracles. However, Jesus said nothing in response to Herod's questions or the accusations of the chief priests and scribes. And when Herod sent him back to Pilate, and we read at the end of the story, we know he had another bloody death on his hands. So what can we learn from this passage? Well, I think we need to learn that like John the Baptist, we also must take a stand in the face of wrongdoings. We must also stand up for justice. The second thing I think we need to take on board is we need to ask ourselves if sometimes we're guilty of doing things to save face. And then finally, we need to ask ourselves if there are times when we've gone along with the crowd, because it can be so easy. And then later, we learn to regret our decisions. Thankfully, we know that if we do go wrong, we must confess and pray for forgiveness. After all, John's message was of repentance, we remember. And then we must give thanks to God that he hears our prayers and through Jesus, we are forgiven. I still find this a disturbing passage, but it's one which fill, is filled with many lessons and warnings. Amen. We're going to say our creed together now. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Heather is now going to lead us in our prayers. Let us pray. Loving Lord Jesus, we come to you today and thank you for the privilege of praying for others. We thank you that through your name we can come boldly before you and pray with confidence according to your will and know that you hear us. We lift up those who live in the village and surrounding areas and those who can attend the services at St Mary's when possible. Begin with those who follow you and help them influence others for good. Deepen their love for you and for people around them. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. We pray for the Queen, 
as she continues to carry out her duties alone, but with such confidence and duty, an inspiration to many. Lord, in your mercy, hear Hear our our prayer. As we approach the 19th of July, a landmark day for all, we pray that we'll finally have the opportunity to lead a life once had before COVID-19. Let us pray that the vaccinations continue to be resistant to new variants and we leave the word of lockdown in the dictionary. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. As this term's education comes to an end, we pray that all students receive the grades they have worked so hard to achieve under immense pressure and difficulties over the past 16 months. And they can continue to achieve great things either by moving into sixth form education, applying for their desired university or seeking their chosen career pathway. Lord, in your mercy, hear Hear our prayer. We pray for the lost, the hurting, the lonely, the sick, the dying and the bereaved and those who are imprisoned behind both visible and invisible walls. Send your comfort, your peace and your calming presence to those who are without hope. Lord, in your mercy, hear Hear our our prayer. prayer. So many needs, Jesus, but you are adequate for every need. Your name is powerful and your power is great. So it's in your name that we pray and believe. Amen. Our collect for today. Merciful God, you have prepared for those who love you such good things as pass our understanding. Pour into our hearts such love towards you that we, loving you in all things and above all things, may obtain your promises, which exceed all that we can desire. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And so gathering our prayers and praises into one, let us pray with confidence as our Saviour has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. And now may the blessing of God Almighty the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you always. Amen.